So you see that uh, the topic that, uh, uh, that I'll be addressing is a, is a bit of a mouthful. I don't know how many words that it, it, it is, but originally my topic was called, <clears throat> there's the first part, that is the increasing importance of international law in world affairs. <clears throat> the remainder was added at the su suggestion of, of uh, <coughs> our host and convener, Mr. Donfried, <coughs> whom I hasten to thank for inviting me to address you today. Uh, he thought it would be better that I that you would have a better idea of what I will be talking about uh, this, uh, this afternoon. Now, the shorter title, I admit, could have been seen as somewhat uh, ambiguous. I say the role, the increasing importance of international law, increasing importance of international law in world affairs. You would understand that uh, a topic like this could lead me along two possible paths. One would be a tale of woe lending, ending up in desperation. <coughs> I chose another path, that is, the path of hope. That is, and I, can, I will be this afternoon uh, reaching finally the conclusion that, <coughs> yes, uh, there are problems in world affairs, that goes without saying, but my thesis is that <coughs> they can be solved through the proper implementation of international law. Secondly, that they are being addressed through the proper implementation of international law. More importantly, they will continue to be addressed through the proper Im implementation of international law to deal with problems of the future. So this is my uh, message of hope, appropriate to the festive season that we are uh, embarking upon, but also, uh, I think, appropriate in this forum. Uh, we are an institute, institute which has developed forward-looking and innovative approaches to solving problems in uh, world affairs. So this theme, <coughs> the theme of this conference is, uh, one of the themes is the rule of law. Can I still be heard back there? I'm not sure. Okay. So this is, of course, a very important concept, but <coughs> also one that defies uh, description. A very good friend of mine, Hans Karel, who was for many years the legal counsel of the um, United Nations, a colleague of long standing, it was one of the architects of what is called the, um, <coughs> the Guide to Politicians on the Rule of Law, the Guide to Politicians on the Rule of Law. Uh, <coughs> Hans Karel summed up the rule of law as being composed of four elements. One, democracy. Two, proper legislation reflecting international standards, particularly in the field of international human rights. Third, the institutions which are necessary to administer the law, including impartial and independent courts. Listen to this, impartial and independent courts. And finally, the individuals with the necessary knowledge and integrity <coughs> for the proper administration of these institutions. You will hear today <coughs> that all these four components are an important part of what I've been talking about today, and I'm sure what you've been discussing uh, this today and in the next few days. Now as for the other components of my title, <coughs> I will be setting out somewhat of a personal history. I'll explain that a little bit later. Um, and, and if I were to identify, looking again at the title, the, the, <coughs> the, um, the most important developments in the last 20 or 30, 30 years, I would identify three. The first, and this is a, the main theme of my, my speech, is the development of a comprehensive dispute settlement mechanism under a, a new panor panorama of courts, international courts. The second is the elaboration and adoption of the uh, United Nations um, uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea, which I consider one of the major achievements of the United Nations. And third is the elaboration of, and adoption <coughs> and entry into force of the statute of the International Criminal Court. Now, as for the two latter, I will not be discussing so much the substance of these, uh, these bodies, but rather the process of their elaboration, again, building on my uh, personal experience. <coughs> um, I hope that uh, you will forgive me tonight in <coughs> when I uh, present a rather personal account 
of this history and, and the items that I mentioned. I recently uh, <coughs> suffered or enjoyed or experienced or uh, lived through a, <coughs> a, a, a anniversary of the a big anniversary of when I first entered into this field. As a consequence, one has a chance to review, think about the past. And in fact, uh, as a traditional for people in my profession, a Zeitschrift or a Liber Amicorum was presented in which, as I said, a lot of talk about the past and my experience over the years. <coughs> um, so this will be, in a sense, a brisk, a short half hour trip through memory lane. And I hope, as I said, I'll be forgiven, be, be somewhat personal. I, I remember, um, I'm now a professor in, the <coughs> in, the, in India. And when I first started teaching there, I didn't know so much about the, you know, the way things are done. And uh, midway through the, my first semester, I asked the students to meet me and tell me, give their impressions. And one of them came to me and said, oh, professor, oh, professor, I wish you wouldn't tell all these stories if they're not going to be on the final exam. So, so I always begin every year after this, I say, you can tell me anything, but don't tell me that, because that's what people are supposed to be hearing from me. Uh, but again, it looks very uh, personal. Now, <clears throat> um, I would have to say that I am a creature of the Uni United Nations. All my life, a professional life, I've been involved with the UN. <clears throat> so I was working in the Secretariat, I've been, um, as the delegate of my country, by the way, I'm from Iceland, in the General Assembly for many, many years. <coughs> I served as a consultant to the UN. I served as a legal expert in the UN process. And then finally, as a judge in the, in the court, which is very closely related to the um, uh, United Nations. So it's just, uh, just under 50 years when I first, as an awestruck student, entered into the Delegates' Lounge in UN head headquarters in, in New York. And I can still relate to that feeling. And then followed by some four years later when I took up my own office on the 27th floor of that same building. Uh, and this is the feeling that I have then has continued throughout this time. And uh, so you'll see me as a great advocate of the UN and not, uh, I'm not an apologist, I, be I believe, in the cause. But in between, I had the good fortune of having been mentored by Sir Francis Vallat, uh, uh, Richard Gardner, and particularly Lou Hinken. These are names which may be known to uh, many of you. All of them fervent uh, supporters and advocates of the UN project. <coughs> um, Sir Francis Vallat was a United Kingdom uh, member of the International Law Commission. I succeeded him in a nearly direct way some 20 years after this period. <coughs> uh, Richard Gardner, professor at Columbia, also had a similar profession, similar um, uh, uh, trajectory as myself, worked as an ambassador, has worked in government, uh, and was a professor. But Lou Henkin is the, is, has been my mentor for all this time. We were, were very closely uh, connected th throughout his life. <coughs> So in many ways, I find myself a successor to my, my former uh, professors. It was Professor Henkin in his book, this seminal book, the <coughs> um, How Nations Behave. How Nations Behave is his book, his seminal book. He suggested that if one wanted to know the role of international law in world affairs, one should study the actions of the legal advisors of foreign ministries. And here I am, 20, after having served 20 years in that very position uh, in the foreign ministry of Iceland. Uh, and I have to say that my, um, my attitude towards international law has been very much uh, informed by uh, the pragmatic advice I had uh, in my early days. And I don't know how this fits in with the theory of international law, but I'll come to that later. Um, so uh, you, you will find me, I'm not tr I will not try to be too lawyerly, I don't even know, I've met a number of you uh, this afternoon, none of which actually told me that they had legal training. Uh, I don't know if that's the case, but it doesn't matter, I plan to be not so-called uh, lawyerly, and I'll come back to that later. <coughs> but uh, turning back to the UN, we recall that Monday, uh, was it Monday, was the the 70th anniversary of the adoption of the 
uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights Monday, right? Lost track of the, the days here. Uh, and on that occasion, or to honor that, uh, to reflect that occasion, Michelle uh, uh, Bachelet, the UN High Commissioner for uh, Human Rights, set out a message of qualified hope. Uh, qualified hope, I say, which mirrors the, uh, the theme of my talk uh, this evening. And I, I'll quote it in extenso. <coughs> she wrote, People are increasingly fearful of the great changes our world is experiencing. And it is precisely at times of turmoil and uncertainty that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights can guide us. Step by step, she wrote, it lights the path. We need more respect, greater justice. We need to uphold human equality and dignity. And we can achieve this, she writes. All of us, wherever we are, can make a difference by standing up for everyone's uh, human rights. A great statement. Now, her successor, uh, uh, Navi Pile, uh, her predecessor, rather, sounded uh, also recently a rather more pessimistic note. She referred, and I quote, to demagogy, unbridled nationalism, and populism on a scale not seen since the Second World War. She puts this period in the period compared to the probably the worst time in recent history. Now, in the same vein, many of us, I'm sure, can recall what uh, President Macron said at the 100th anniversary uh, of the end of the, uh, the First World War, speaking of, and I quote again, selfishness of nations only looking after their own interests because patriotism is exactly the opposite of nationalism. Patriotism is the, exactly the opposite of nationalism. And of course, nationalism is the very antithesis of internationalism, which is my theme today. Now, we know what they are, all, all these three are referring to, contemporary issues, uh, times, the, the issues that we know uh, so well from our daily life, really. <coughs> but this reflects, um, uh, we can add to this uh, e even more extreme challenges in recent years. Uh, Rwanda, genocide, the uh, crimes against humanity committed in former Yugoslavia, <coughs> invasions of Kuwait and Iraq, the plague of international uh, terrorism, and in fact, the, the ancillary uh, adverse effects of the responses to international terrorism on the international human rights regime. So, having set out these situations, how all of which re relate to gross breaches of international law, how will I, or how have I been able to arrive at the conclusion, which I already told you I have in this speech, right? It sounds like a horrible, uh, I'm not, again, I can't uh, remember thinking I was talking on a day like this on Human Rights Day <coughs> in, a, in, a, in an interview in, in Iceland. So and you, you're, you're in a tele it was, a, it was a, a radio interview. But in the radio interview, they have a huge clock, you know, say, and it ticks down to say when, you, when you're over. So we talked about generally about these things and so forth. And then with one minute to go, the man asked me, well, what do you think about the state of the world today? <coughs> What do you do? <coughs> so I, I choked. I said, "Well, I keep. I come back to the, you know, my message of hope. Look, you know, the, the situation is dire, but this. Think about how things have been in the past, and we can argue uh, about this. And I'm sure. I know you had a presentation before I arrived about a place, part of the world, which is experiencing, uh, you know, bad times, but." <coughs> To me, you know, the part, an the part answer to this question, how it can be so uh, uh, optimistic, is that, I, I, uh, I don't know if you've noticed, as I have, that even in the most intractable disputes, you'll find the parties making some reference to international law. I mean, I give examples. Just recently, if you read the, read the press, the <coughs> the, the, um, and in particular, they talk about international humanitarian law. Uh, I just read a report about the negotiations, consultations taking place in Sweden about the Yemen. Um, 
the discussions in Geneva uh, about Syria, to mention very contemporary examples. And then more recently, even at, at when, when the press was discussing the, uh, the uh, confrontation between Russian and Ukrainian vessels off the, um, in the Kerch Strait, again, uh, reference was made by all parties <coughs> to the international law, the need to uphold international law. And even from outside the region, from what might say unlikely sources, including from high officials of the uh, United, Sta United States government. All of them refer to the need to abide by international law. And I think you could read between the lines, I don't know if you noticed, a <coughs> a, um, uh, an interview with um, uh, a former Secretary of State of the United States in which he, well, kind of said that he had forestalled what would have been uh, somewhat disastrous activities by appealing to his powers uh, about the rule of law, the need to comply with the rule of law, and I read that, as I said before, in our context, uh, international law. Well, history shows us, of course, that uh, merely pay referring to international law uh, is not uh, always followed up by implementation. Of course, that is our problem. And this uh, uh, brings us, as I told you earlier, to the discourse on the very nature of international law. Now, as I said, I don't plan to be um, uh, lawyerly in, in, uh, in this uh, respect, but I do recognize that my field, the international law, is a rather arcane field. I have to admit that. And I remember uh, uh, addressing uh, a conference or <coughs> on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the, of the peace conference in The Hague in, in 1899. <coughs> uh, the the uh, conference took place in the, in the um, uh, great hall of the, of the peace palace in, in The Hague uh, where the International Court of Justice sits. And I was representing my then court, uh, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, and we were sitting on the podium, <coughs> uh, judges from all the most of the then existing international courts. And I looked in this, over this body, and the Great Hall is not that great. I don't know how many people, uh, but not a lot of people, maybe two or three times this size, thought to myself, well, this is a very large portion of the international law community. Imagine that. How could that be said about nearly any other field of, uh, of law? <coughs> I, was, I compared uh, uh, even uh, somewhat uh, facetiously maybe, to if we were had a, nearly any other field, we would have a much larger audience. But that was the situation. And I think, again, uh, in, uh, in my teaching, students come to me very interested in the topic, uh, asking for advice on their future, <coughs> and I send them off, all of them, to uh, LLM programs. But can I really tell them that there is a future in this, in this field? As a, uh, can you get a job, basically, in international law? Well, the jobs are very few. <coughs> Now, when I, uh, uh, I had the honor to, uh, some 20 years ago, to uh, be asked to set up a, <coughs> a program of international law and human rights at the University of Peace. It's an organ, uh, UN-affiliated uh, uh, university in Costa Rica. <coughs> and uh, I and my colleague uh, decided that we would not make it a prerequisite for this course a legal degree. We thought it is best to have a, and in that, in the, 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 uh, the degree is called Master, master of Arts in International Law, uh, and one and the other is in International uh, Human Rights. <coughs> we thought it'd be better to be able to call on a wide range of uh, students and just uh, uh, acquaint them with the tools of international law, not necessarily making them experts in it, but uh, enough experts to be able to, in their positions in other fields, being able to acquaint policymakers with the, the possibilities of using international law <coughs> as a mechanism to solve their disputes, and then <coughs> hopefully becoming those policymakers themselves, and then uh, being able to apply this discipline. <coughs> so we have uh, over 300 students now having graduated from this program along this basis. Uh, <coughs> well, coming back to the uh, 
in the nature of, uh, of uh, public international law. I'm sure many of you know that there is a, a discussion regularly about whether international law is law. You'll find in many courses, uh, the, one of the examination questions is, yeah, you know, is international law law? And then you have to write a thesis about that. <coughs> uh, again, not being lawyerly, you would find that this discussion usually relates to the, dis the distinction between our international system, that is the international system of, of states, <coughs> and the, the domestic system, uh, and then on the basis of whether uh, <coughs> uh, the components of the national system are um, evident in the international system. That is, as regards enforcement, uh, legislation, and the judicial components of the national system. I want to comment on these uh, in turn. But before I do that, let me uh, point out that when we are talking about the types of breaches that I mentioned to you earlier, we are not talking, of course, about the rule in the international community about on the application of international law. Um, international law being applied on a day-to-day -day basis. And here again, I quote uh, Professor Henkin, in which he said very famously, Almo almost all nations observe almost all principles of international law and almost all of their obligations almost all of the time. So he says, almost all nations observe almost all principles of international law and almost all of their obligations almost all of the time. Now, of course, when they don't, this is when we see uh, the, the public uh, and the press in involved. But turning to this first uh, component, that is the enforcement component, yes, we have to admit, there is no hierarchical system of enforcement of international law. Again, I could quote uh, in a more uh, lawyerly setting, uh, but Professor Henkin wrote about this, that there is a system of horizontal enforcement. Why do we, in fact, in our own lives, why do we abide by law? Is it necessarily because we expect to be prosecuted? Why do we keep to the speed limits and so forth? No, there's a horizontal enforcement in national law as well as in international law. Now, I must admit, <coughs> well, the, U the UN Charter, which I should have begun by saying, of course, is the major contribution to international law in the world. It just happens to precede uh, my own experience. Um, the, uh, it was originally envisaged at UN that there would be some kind of an enforcement mechanism. We know what happened. The Cold War intervened in that. I must say that when the Cold War was no more, I saw I had certain expectations that maybe we would be able to revert to this system, that the United Nations, through the Security Council, which can be a very powerful uh, tool for enforcement, would take up the original uh, uh, vision of the United Nations. Well, that was not to be. It is still not the case, and it may never be the case. But the reasons for that, I think, um, well, Again, maybe related to the personalities of the, of the per people that are in charge of that. <clears throat> but coming to the second element, that is the legislative element, I can tell you that we spoke of, uh, my title refers to history. So to me, the history <coughs> of international law began with the adoption of the Charter of the UN. I can say that now, in the 70 or so years since, <coughs> some 80, to 90 percent of international, public international law has been put in, for, in some form of treaty or other binding language. Uh, so I say 80 uh, to 90 percent, of course, that's not a scientific term, but <coughs> it gives the impression, I think, of what I, what I feel. And much of, that, and much of that work, I was involved. Um, I've already mentioned the law of the sea. Now we have the situation where 70 percent of the Earth's surface is regulated by international law. And we add, you know, treaty law, state responsibility, water courses, you name it. Very few fields are left to be uh, elaborated in this form. <coughs> so uh, the situation has radically changed in that respect in, in the past 70 years. Uh, and by the way, when I speak about lawmaking, I now no longer distinguish between formally binding instruments and, uh, and what we sometimes call soft law because soft law has been proven to be as effective in dealing with contemporary problems as formally binding instruments. And one example we just saw was, was signed just the other day in Marrakesh, uh, dealing with migration and um, uh, what specifically is called uh, the, um, 
the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regula Regular uh, Migration. Again, the, the time was not ripe for a binding instrument, but we will find the principles laid down in that Global Compact will help us to deal with very important contemporary problems. <coughs> well, I would add, of course, uh, since we are talking about already about the Universal Declaration, in the course of the seven years of the UN, we have now an entirely new body of, of international law in the field of human rights. I say we begin from scratch in the early times. I have to say we began with less than scratch. There was uh, the opposite of a human rights regime when we began this, this project. <coughs> and I, add, I will continue to add uh, to this project the, the work of the International Criminal Court. I remember that the <coughs> I was very much involved, I just jumped to that now, in the elaboration of the statute of the International Criminal Court. You will know the history of that. It began because of what the, the tribunals which were established in, um, to deal with the situations in Rwanda and the, um, and the former Yugoslavia. Now, the, the historians amongst us know that since the Nuremberg and the Tokyo trials, there was no system of international responsibility for international crimes. And, uh, uh, well, uh, at a certain stage when that, those processes were taking place, Rwanda and, and, um, and Yugoslavia, the International Law Commission, of which I was then a member, was asked to return to the original project some uh, seven years earlier, actually, to adopt a convention on settlement of, um, of, of um, on international criminal courts. Now, in many respects, <coughs> You will know in the history of that that um, many of the states that allowed that project to continue to, to get started under the UN auspices were, in a sense, making up for them not having acted to prevent those uh, atrocities in Rwanda and Yugoslavia. This is the fact, and I must admit that many of those countries felt that by putting it into the hands of the International Law Commission, which was a historically slow-moving uh, group this would be, have the effect of killing the project. <coughs> Little did they know that there was in the International Law Commission at that time a number of, of people that were very keen on this project, <coughs> and particularly under the work of, uh, uh, of uh, Professor Crawford and at, at, uh, at Cambridge, we were able to produce a draft statute in a very short time, and that process began uh, <coughs> in, the, um, in the UN, and we ended up in the, the statute of the International Criminal Court. But I have to tell you that it was very touch and go to the very last moment when that statute was adopted. And <coughs> as we look at the story, situation today, many of you I know will be acquainted with uh, uh, the work of the International Criminal Court. It has not been a total success, but I maintain hope that it will, get, will uh, achieve the aims which are set out in the preamble to the statute. Just this uh, July, the final uh, step in the elaboration of the statute was taken when the, um, a new, the crime of aggression became the fourth core crime <coughs> of the, um, uh, on the, uh, within, in the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. <coughs> and um, again, we'll, we'll see the future. We'll, uh, we don't know the future of the work of this, uh, this uh, court, but I know I, I, and I continue to believe that it will provide, uh, achieve the aims for which it was established. Well, I promised that I was going to speak about the International Convention of the Law of the Sea. This has been my life if you, uh, from the very the few first days that I mentioned when I joined the UN. <coughs> I came directly from law school into the 27th floor of the general, uh, headquarters of the UN and, and began this process of the elaboration of the Convention on the Law of the Sea. <coughs> now, at that time, I would say I can't really uh, explain why, all the leading international the law scholars became involved in this process. <coughs> it was like a who's who of international law. Uh, and they, now, most of these lawyers, you understand, <coughs> would, because it's a political process, uh, we're, we're seeking to elaborate an agreement, 
were also savvy in, in that sense uh, in the uh, dealing with in world affairs in general. <coughs> and, but together, they, they produced this amazing uh, uh, convention dealing with, as I said before, 70% of the, of the uh, uh, Earth's surface. Now, particularly important, again, from uh, the treatise that I'm uh, trying to propose today, is the elaboration of the, the settlement of disputes mechanism in the convention. We have within this convention a self-contained comprehensive regime for the settlement of disputes. Now this was, the, this was elaborated at a time when the question of or the possibility of international adjudication was very slim. There were many, in, many uh, countries in the world for various reasons which were absolutely against uh, settlement of disputes through a third party mechanism. The former Soviet countries had a policy not to accept third party. Their, their way to resolve disputes was through, <coughs> uh, was through uh, 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 negotiations, which is fine, but they would not have accepted the, the possibility of a third party. Uh, <coughs> other countries, large countries, uh, would <coughs> uh, didn't think that they had to uh, put themselves in the position of being subject to third party disputes. And then most importantly, at that time, we're talking uh, early 70s, the, the developing countries had turned against or perhaps never adopted the view uh, or the attitude towards international uh, adjudication. <coughs> and again, historians can tell you why that is. I won't go into that. So when we sat down to prepare this convention, it was an uphill fight to include uh, settlement of disputes within it. And I mentioned before Louis Son, a professor at Harvard, he became a member of the US delegation, and I say more or less single-handedly brought together colleagues from who were uh, similarly minded to produce a draft uh, s uh, settlement of dispute mechanism. <coughs> now, um, I think, and looking back at these people, all my seniors, that uh, they were inspired by the possibility to realize the dreams which I mentioned before had been laid down in the Charter of the UN. Many of them had, of course, lived through the Second World War, Another half of them were living through colonialism. They, I think, sat down and were trying to realize that, Im that, that vision and produce this, uh, this, uh, th this instrument. So we now have today <coughs> an international court, uh, again, very unprecedented, uh, unexpected at that time, dealing specifically with the law of the sea, and I was one of the first members of that, that court. <coughs> And I would maintain that the, the system that was developed there on in negotiations passed on into the negotiations leading to the International Criminal Court. So in the sense, the International Criminal Court is also a successor of the success of the International uh, Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. I want to come to kind of a close by <coughs> uh, referring to one of the bet noirs in my, my, uh, my own profession the distinction between law and politics. Many times in my career, I find uh, <coughs> sitting in my office and uh, working on a project and somebody from another department uh, comes to me and says, ah, 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 uh, this is a political, it's not, it's not within your ambit as a lawyer to deal with. Uh, so you will find that, that, uh, that um, uh, that antagonism between the tension, shall we say, between those two uh, elements has continued throughout in the world, world affairs. And again, coming back to my mentor, Lou, Lou Henkin, he called this a, a half-truth at best because he said law, law is politics. Law is politics. And I, I use this as solace when I argue for uh, a role of law in the settlement of, 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 of even the most political disputes. Well, I promised that I wouldn't be lawyerly, but <coughs> I would like to uh, I close this section by um, referring to the work of the International uh, Court of Justice in extremely political questions. I would have referred to the Nicaragua uh, case in which the United States was chastised for <coughs> for having contributed to the civil war there. The genocide case, uh, <coughs> which, was, uh, in, which was remarkable for, even, but for being brought at all at a time when the, uh, the atrocities which were being discussed were ongoing. <coughs> the question of the use of uh, the, the, the advisory opinion on, on the use of nuclear weapons, all very political questions. 
can a court deal with those, uh, those questions? Well, I will leave the lawyerly part uh, to quote what the International Court of Justice said about that in the armed actions case. They, <coughs> they said as follows. The court has noted that while political aspects may be present in any legal dispute brought before it, the court was only concerned to establish that the dispute in question was a legal dispute, and they quote themselves from their earlier uh, decision, legal dispute in the sense of a dispute capable of being settled by the application of principles and rules of international law. And this was the, the armed, armed action case between Nicaragua and Honduras. <coughs> Uh, the most recent case before the International Court of Justice has been brought by Palestine against the United States, dealing with the legality of the relocation of the embassy of the United States to Jerusalem. <coughs> we cannot imagine in the region a more political dispute, but we'll see. I, won't, I can't comment on that now because uh, it, it's just begun in the very early stages, but you cannot imagine a more um, <coughs> a political dispute. Well, having said all this, I think I can come to repeat the conclusion that I laid down uh, when I started. The, the United Nations General Assembly has uh, recently declared that the, uh, the, the <coughs> purposes and, and principles of the UN Charter, that international law and justice, and an international order based on the rule of law are indispensable foundations for a more peaceful, prosperous, and just world. And I hope I've been able to build the case for the conclusion, which I mentioned, as I said in the beginning, that many of the problems we face in the contemporary world can be addressed through the proper implementation of international law, and moreover, that they are being uh, addressed through the work of the increasingly effective and active international courts, and, and that we can expect this process to continue. Thank you.